Ah, okay, just for the recording. Sorry, for the okay, I will just speak loudly. Okay. So, hi everyone, my name is Julian. So, I'm here today to talk about, le about optics and uh, lenses. So, optics are a set of functional concepts that facilitate the access and manipulation of immutable objects. So, today I would like to go through four optics, namely ISO, uh, PRISM, lenses, and optional. So there are many more than this one, but I think they are really useful and they will be really helpful to understand how do they relate to each other. So just, uh, just a word about me. Uh, I'm the author of Monocle, which is a Scala library that implements optics. It's mainly inspired from Haskell Lens, which is definitely the most awesome library that I know about lenses. But there are also other Scala libraries that do optics, like Shapeless, do it, uh, Scala Z. I think there is also Quick Lens. So, I mean, it's not the only library in Scala, and it exists in many other programming languages. So this is relatively universal. Um, yeah. So just before I start, you can really interrupt me at any time if you have any question or something is not clear. Really, don't hesitate. So let's start with the basic of functional programming, which is a function. So what's a function? It has an input type, I call it S, and an output type A. So it's also called domain and codomain. So a function transform or morph any value on the input type into a value on the output type. So we know that for any value in S, we can transform an S into an A. And what's awesome about function is that they compose together. So if we have a function from S to A and a function from A to B, we can merge them together to get a function from S to B. And that's really awesome because we can go from simple function to more complex one just by composing them together. This concept is very generic, and, and so it means that we don't have many ideas of what is a concrete implementation from a function from S to A. So it could be some random mapping, like in that case, or we could have like a constant function like here, all, all functions on the input map to a single value in the output. We also have no idea about the size of the input and the output. We could be in a case where the input side, input side is much bigger than the output, and it means that several values in the input map to one value in the output. Or we can be in the contrary, where many, the output side is much bigger than the input side. So it means that there are some values in the output that, are, that do not have any image. So, as an exercise, we could try to focus into something like, which will be more constrained, but probably more powerful. And by this, I mean like about isomorphism. So, what's an isomorphism? It's it's a pair of function, f and g. So, f go from s to a, and a from and g from a to s. And f and g are the inverse of each other. This means that if you take any value in s and you go to a using f. Then you can use G to come back to S, and you come back to the, s to the same value exactly. So this is what this uh, property says. And we have the same property for A. So if we get any value in A, we use a G, and then we use F again, we come back to the exact value in A. So basically, there is a one-to-one -one matching between S and A, and it's lossless. So when we go from S to A, we don't lose any information. So how could we implement this in Scala? Typically, we could have a case class, namely ISO, with two type parameters, S and A, and two functions, get and reverse get, that are exactly the F and G that we had before. On top of this, we need the two properties, and at the moment, we cannot encode it in Scala. So I just want to, let's assume that when we create an ISO, these two properties exist, and, and we'll talk about later, how can we uh, you know, link these properties to our case class. So we have an ISO. Let's try to see what sort of useful function could we derive out of this. So if we have a function f from a to a, we can lift it to, from a to s to s. How do we do that? We simply use get and reverse get. So we say, if we have a s, we go to a, a using get. Then we use our f, and then reverse get again. So basically, 
when you have an ISO between S and A, you can lift any method, any function between A to A to a function to S to S, which is quite useful. Even more important, we can compose them. So if we have an ISO between S and A, and an ISO between A and B, we get an ISO between S and B. So now all this method integrate into, into our case class. So we say we have our modify method that takes a function A to A and give us a S to S. We have reverse. Reverse just, oh, sorry. Reverse simply changes the uh, type parameter of our ISO. Because, like if you have an ISO between S and A, you also have an ISO between A and S. It's, you can switch them. It's very simple. You just switch the get and reverse get. And you can compose them. So if you have an ISO SA and another ISO A to B, you get an ISO SB. So these are our ISO case class and its derived method. Now let's try to see like, some useful application. So let's imagine we have a class robot who has maybe some direction and a function move by. And this function move by take D, uh, like a distance in double. And so now we create our robot. Let's call it Nono. And we want to move Nono by 100.5 meters. So we just call it like this. Simple. But in some other part of our program, maybe someone <laughs> wants to move Nono by 3 kilometers. So it will put 3. And maybe somewhere else use this weird system matrix <laughs> called as yard. <laughs> and we'll, we'll use it like this. So basically, the only way to know the, the unit of, of your double, of uh, the distance you're using, is to look at the documentation, which is like very brittle. And there are many ways that. I mean, it's very easy to make mistakes. And in real life, it, it happens several times where like a satellite misses a target or things blow up just because of this kind of mistake. And we can do much better than this. So what, what are the options? We could simply say, let's create some case classes and like one for meter, one for yard that will encapsulate a double. And then in our API, we'll say, no, when we want to move by, we need to, pr we need to give meters. So potentially, someone could put still some rubbish data inside of meter, but he, he will have to consciously create a meter out of a double, which reduces the risk of, of misinterpreting. And it's like a documentation by itself. You just look at the type, and you kind of understand what, is, what does it expect. You don't need to look at the documentation. And the benefit is that if you, you can call it using meters, but if someone tried to call it using a double or a yard, of course it doesn't compile. So there might be some performance implication, but there are ways in Scala to make it better. I don't really want to go in, in that area today. So how can we use ISO to help us with this problem? Because, um, just to come back, the, the annoying part is that we st since it's an API, we probably want to offer like different like metric systems. So we could say, OK, you can move by kilometers. We could overload the method move by and provide all different like metrics. But it's pretty annoying. And if we have another method to do this, then, then I mean, it's not maintainable. Uh, at the same time, if we just put meter, then people have to make the conversion by themselves, and it's easy to make it wrong. So one way we could do is that to use ISO to simplify this, this API. We can easily create an ISO between meter and yard. Like if you have one meter, you get, you get some yard, and, and the contrary. I'd, I never remember the exact value, but here it is. So we could. <laughs> We could implement an ISO bit meter to yard that just say, OK, I'm getting some meters, and I multiply it by this value over there, uh, just using Wikipedia to find it. Huh? And, and the contrary, I mean, so in one sense, we, in one side we multiply it, in the other side we divide it. Pretty simple. And now we can use meter to yard, get, to transform any meter into yards. And if we could use reverse get to do the reverse transformation. And now if we want to use move by, we can simply, if someone wants to pass yard, we can call the method reverse get. There are also other ways to make this uh, more readable or more concise. We could lift a method or all that stuff, but the idea is here. Can I ask a very quick question? Sure. Because I'm sitting next to Eric. I'm looking at that and wondering, is because, because of the semantics of doubles, is that really an isomorphism? It's a good question. I will, come back, I, I, I will come back to it very shortly. But that's a good idea. <laughs> that, that's a very good question. So now, I mean, what is it? it's a bit useful, but where it really shines when we start to introduce more metrics, more, more units. 
So we saw that it was relatively easy to create an ISO between meter and yard. But now, if we want to create an ISO between meter and kilometer, it's even more simple. It's just you multiply or divide by 1,000. So we can implement it relatively easily. But what we get for free is that we get an ISO between ca kilometers and yard. We just compose kilometer and meter and meter to yard. So we just walk through the ISO. And we can go even further. More, more unit we add, better it becomes. So if we now add an ISO between yard and miles, we get all the one uh, in dots for free. So we can get an between meter and miles, yard and kilometer, and, and so on. How, how do you implement it concretely? So you define a case class kilometer, mile, um, some implementation to meter for the ISO between meter and kilometer and yard and mile. And so if we want to implement kilometer to mile, so we have meter to kilometer, so we need to reverse it to get kilometer to meter. Then we compose it with the one meter to yard, and then we compose it with yard to mile. And then we get, some, we get an ISO between kilometer and mile. It may not be the most efficient, but at least you're sure it's correct as long as the, f the one in between are correct. Which is your point. Um, other ISO. We could uh, imagine an ISO between string and list of characters because they are exactly the same things. They're just kind of, yeah, it's just like a sequence of characters. It's either a string, a list of char characters, a vector of characters. It can be many things. So here we can, and, and what's nice with an ISO, it's a, it's a documentation by itself. So when you see an ISO between two types, you know that these two things are equivalent. Uh, same between list and vector, they are just two sequence. There is one more efficient than the other in, in some for some, some, for some functions. Uh, but, but potentially they are equivalent. So we can have this transformation to vector or to list and go back and forth. Another use case would be like for generic programming. So if we have a case object like red, well, red, a case object is just a singleton. And what is the like, most basic singleton is unit. The unit is this type and it's the single value is the double parenthesis. So we can implement an ISO between red and unit just by saying, if you give me red, I give you unit. If you give me unit, I give you red. Simple. Uh, same for any case classes. It's probably more useful is that a case class is just a glorified tuple where we give some names to the underscore one or underscore two parameter. So in that case, what I'm saying is a person, which is a name and an age, is isomorphic to a tuple string and int. And we'll see later why it can be useful. I mean, something like just an idea, it means that if we have such an ISO, it means that if we have a function from tuple to tuple, we can lift it to a function to person to person. And this is applicable to any, uh, any case class with two parameters. So it can be useful. So now let's come back to the properties. So we say like an ISO has two functions, but also it needs to satisfy these two properties. Say like we can run trip. If we start from an S, we can go to A. And if we have an A, we can come back to the same S. So how can we implement this in Scala? Because we, we cannot prove it, or at least I don't know how to do it. But we can uh, simulate it somehow using property-based testing. So this is an example using Scala Check, which is one of the library implementing property-based testing. I think another one is called Scala Props. It's relatively recent. Uh, so what does this thing mean? I mean, who is familiar with Scala Check here? OK, most people. So I'll, I'll go quickly. So we just say, like, if, I j if I'm able to generate random S, I can go back and forth using reverse get and get, and same if I'm able to, r to generate random A. And this sort of, of laws are defined in the library you're using. And you, as a user, you don't need to, to implement this test yourself. As a user, you simply use this uh, check all uh, function that just say, OK, I have a meter to yard ISO. I want to verify that it's a proper ISO, ISO then it will do it for you. So you don't have a guarantee that you are 100% correct. But over time, it will eventually show you if you're wrong. Like I had a case recently that after a year, one, um, one, one optic turned out to be wrong. And one of the input like, uh, finally came up to, to be a counterexample. And it took a year to run every single build. And at some point, it finally found out. 
it was between string and int, like a conversion, uh, and it turned out that we had like one mischaracter that we, we didn't think about, and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so in that case, uh, this uh, Scala check test is going to fail for the reason you mentioned. So I actually uh, wrote it myself, this, this ISO, and I let Scala check find out like a, a counterexample. And here's the result. So it told me that after 24 tries, this value, I don't know if we can see it properly, this value, uh, this yard doesn't uh, satisfy the round trip property. And if you actually take the ripple, you can see that since we're using double, we are losing some precision, and that's why we don't have a real ISO. So we probably should use rational or some other precise type to actually implement this, this uh, unit conversion. But this is a good example of how useful like uh, property-based testing uh, can be useful. So now, uh, as we can see, I mean, ISO are relatively limited. They are limited to things that are equivalent. So if you take two types, it's very unlikely they will be equivalent. So one idea here is to try to relax uh, the definition of isomorphism and try to see what, what can we get out of it, what sort of useful property we can get. Basically, it will, something will be, uh, hopefully we'll be able to use it in more cases, but it will be weaker. So the idea of can we relax our ISO is to say f, in, so we still have a function f and g, and s and a, nothing has changed, but in that case, f is a partial function. It means that if our s is in this area, then we can go to an A, and we can always come back using our G. But if S is in this area, it's not defined, so we, we don't know what to do. We, we don't have any value. So in other words, we could, we could say that F is a function from S to option of A, where if S is here, then we get a sum of A, and if S is here, we get none. And we have the, exactly the same law that for the ISO. They just say, like, if it's here, we can do, we can do the, the round trip. If it's here, we have no properties. And if we start from, a, from an A, we can always do the round trip. So in optics, this thing is called a prism. So it's still a case class, still two type parameter S and A, still has a function reverse get. The only thing that has changed is now it has a function get option instead of get. So get option is a function from S to option of A. And here are the two properties that I, I discussed. So do you have any idea of uh, any concept in Scala that actually match these two functions? And I can tell you that if you use Scala, this, these two functions, you use them on a daily basis. It, they are really, really common. But this pattern might be, I mean, it took me a while to... Apply and unapply. Correct. So apply and apply, there are two functions that are automatically generated by, I mean, most of the time, automatically generated by the Scala compiler. So let's take an example of a, a linked list. So a li we have a linked list, a list of A, that is either a counts or a nil. So a count is just head and tails, and nil is a, the empty list. So s the compiler will automatically generate an, an apply method on counts that will say, if you give me a list, I will try to separate the list between head and tail and it can fail in the case of the empty list. And apply is just a constructor. So if you give me a head and a tail, I will, I will concatenate them. And this uh, two function exactly match a prism. So I could define a prism count. <coughs> that is a prism between a list of A and a tuple A list of A, so the head and tail. And now I can use exactly the same function. So instead of apply and apply, I use get option and reverse get. So a prism it gathers the two concepts of pattern matching and constructor. They put them together. Uh, let's have a look at the derived method we can get out of a prism. So we could have like a is matching function that just say, if you give me an S, does it Am I able to get an A out of it? So it's just calling get option and verify if the get option is, an, is, an op is a sum. We have modify exactly as for ISO. So if I have a function from A to A, I can get a function from S to S. Here the catch is that get option can fail. So what do we do in the case where I'm not able to go from S to an A? Well, in that case, since we have 
we can't do this transformation, it means that modify will return the, uh, the input. So basically, if modify is able to go to an A, it will apply the function and give you the updated S. If it's not able to do this, it will give you the original S. So basically, you only want to use this if you don't care if it's successful or not. If you do care about this, you can use modify option, which does exactly the same thing, except that at the end it will tell you if it's a sum or not, it will tell you if it, it was able to apply the modification that you, you provided. Most importantly, we have like a compose method. So if we have a prism between S and A, and a prism between A and B, we get a prism between S and B. Exactly the same than for ISO. But what's the cool part is that actually we can compose prism and ISO together. So if I have a prism SA and ISO, an ISO AB, I get something of type SB. But the question is, what is this something? Yeah, so we have three possibilities. We have ISO, prism, or something else. So we believe it's a prism. A few. We believe it's an ISO. No one? We believe it's something else. Not many of Ah, still an opinion. Well, you were right. It's a prism. Why? So let's, let's come back to the canonical definition of ISO and prism. So an ISO is a function SAAS. And the prism is S option A, A, S. So basically, the G is exactly the same, so we just pass it by. So we can, we can define a function that converts any ISO into a prism. And all that it do this is just always succeed. So the get option will always call get and will always wrap it in a sum. So it will always succeed. What does this thing mean? Is just if we come back to the original diagram, is that an ISO is a prism where this area is empty. So that's why all ISO are prism, and that's why when we compose um, prism with ISO, we get, a, we get a prism. But also now we could come back to our definition of ISO, and we can compose also an ISO with a prism, and in that case we also get a prism. So these two things compose together in both directions. So let's have a look at a few concrete like examples of prism. So let's say we have an enumeration, like days of the week. Uh, day of the week is Monday, Tuesday, and so on. So we can define an, a prism between day and unit, that let's say, call it Tuesday, that will only match if your day of the week is a Tuesday. So maybe not extremely useful, but still. You, you could say, uh, if the day of the week is a Monday, it will fail. If it's Tuesday, it will succeed. So this weird syntax, like some with extra parentheses said it's a success and the success is unit. There is only one value of unit. And same like you could have your constructor of your singleton that will just use reverse get. So this is not the most useful example. It starts to become more useful when your uh, seal trait has some values inside. So let's, let's take the example of JSON. A JSON is either a G number a J string, or there are also J array, J object, and so on. But let's just uh, focus on these two examples. So JSON is either a, a number or a string. So we can define a J num prism that is a prism between JSON and double. So basically, it will only match if your JSON is a J number. And now, what's cool is that we can lift any function from double to double to JSON to JSON. So we can actually call the function plus one on any JSON. And it will actually do something if your JSON is a J number. And if it's a J string, it will do nothing. And if you're interested, again, about the success or the failure of your modification, you can call modify option. We can use also prism for safe done casting. So we could define a prism between double and int. Basically, this, pr this prism will only match if your double is an integer. So if I say double to int get option 3.0, I get 3. And, but if I put like a, a number with, with comma, it will fail. And in the other way around, well, you cannot just doubleify your, your integer just by uh, adding a 0 to it. So this never failed, never throw, um, I know it's not never failed, but it never throw any exception. It's completely safe. What's cool now is that we can merge these two concepts. So we, we define uh, a prism between JSON and, and double. 
and now we have a prism between double and int. So now we can create a prism between JSON and int by saying, let's call it J int, that will just compose the two prisms that we defined before. So basically, this prism will only match JSON, that RG number, and the number inside is an integer. So it's kind of a nested pattern matching, but you don't need to have like nested case, uh, yeah, match statement. And so this is an example. Any question? Cool. So now, I show this example quite often. So it's, uh, this, this actually prism is very tricky. It's failed in many ways. But this is an example, like, we try to implement uh, a prism between string and int. So basically, it will only match if your string is an int, plus or minus, with a plus or minus in front. Um, and, and we'll be able to print our, our integer. So I wrote it like this the first time by saying, okay, let's, let's reuse the toInt method from, the Java, from Java, where we say, let's call toInt on our string, let's wrap it around a try and catch any exception, and, and transform it into an option, and in the other way around, let's just call toString. And I wrote this, this few unit test at the time. So basically now you can uh, multiply string, you can uh, try to extract uh, numbers out of string, and uh, I, I thought I was clever also because I even thought about the case where your int is bigger than max int and all that stuff, and I was pretty proud of myself. But it turns out that this prism is not, is not lawful. Yeah? You can, you two it will parse things with leading zeros so that you can never generate via the two string method. So yeah. it's not going to have the correct end. Yeah. So do you have any example of a counter example? Like do you have any? A zero string that has zero three. Yeah. So that example, when you parse it, it will parse as three. Yeah. But two string will never produce that value. So it's not a correct inverse. Yeah, that's correct. Another example could be like, a, do you ask, because like for a prism, you, yeah, you could have a case where do you have like plus three and just three? That, you know, because when you will come back to a string, will it con you have to agree or do you put a plus or, don't, or you don't put a plus. But there is even a fancier one that I was very, very really surprised and, and I want to show it to you, is that this actually what sketch I gave me. Is that this character here, this Unicode character, break your prism. Because this is from, I don't remember, I, I checked, it, it was I think like Cambodian or Vietnamese character that actually represents a digit nine. And, awesome. and, <laughs> and you know, in, uh, in the Java 2 int, actually, it's clever enough to recognize that it's a digit nine. So of course, when you call 2 int on it, it, it gives you nine. But there is no way to come back to this symbol. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's another way you can break this. So again, you know, laws are really useful to, to get it correct. Yeah, and I was so happy. You know, at the beginning when I saw that, I said, oh, it must be wrong, it must be wrong. And then, and then I called to it and it, I was, I already stared at my screen during 10 minutes. <laughs> I didn't believe it. So let's just summarize. When do you use prism is for uh, some types. So you have prism between things that are, if a S can be seen as a A or B or C, so typically in Scala, when you have a seal trait, so it's when you say my, a, my S is either A, B, or C. So something interesting will be to see what if we change OR to an AND? What, what do we get? Well, in that case, what, what's something that is an A and a B and a C is typically a tuple or a case class. Why? Because uh, if you have a class S and in that case, you have like a field A and a field B and a field C. And now, what sort of optics could we get out of this? What, what sort of properties will they have? First, we know that they will not have a reverse get method because if I define an optic, if I define a lens between uh, an optics between S and A, well, I'm not able to recreate an S out of an A because I'm losing some information. Another point is that there is always an A inside of an S. So cont contrary, like, you know, a prism has the notion of failure, I might not match, while here we know that we always succeed. So basically what we say that in one sense we always succeed and the other we need some extra information. And how is this encoded is via a get and a set function. So get, uh, pretty straightforward, there is always an A inside of a case class that has A, B and C. 
But set y is like, w so a is not enough. We need an extra s in order to inject our a inside. So yeah, that's the only way we can, we can come back. Uh, what are the properties of a lens? Well, they are, they are pretty straightforward, but, but they are also at great constraint. So this one says that if you call get on an S and you get an A, and then put this A back using set, then you get your original object. And what sort of constraint does this put is that you know that you're not touching anything else than your A using a lens from S to A in, inside of S. Like you couldn't increment a counter on the side or anything else, because in that case you will actually modify the S. So this property really tells you that you can't change anything else. This one says that if you put an A inside of an S, and then you get it back using get, then you will get the same A. So this law basically says that you can't cheat. You know, when you put something using set, you have to put it there. So let's see like how ISO and lenses relate to each other. So they both have the same first method, the get, but ISO is able from any A to come back to S, while a lens needs an extra context to do it. So similar to PRISM, we can say that there is a transformation from ISO to lens. So a lens is a weaker ISO, where basically we say, I don't care about the extra S. As simple as that. So basically, an ISO is a lens where there is no extra context. So kind of a case class with a single element. So why, case, why lenses are famous, or kind of famous? Well, they enable to drill down in the data structure. So if we have a person that is just as a name and age, we can define a lens age that just zoom, zoom inside the age field. So now we can get it, we can set it. So, and I will say even more importantly, like it's probably like a yeah, better API, we can also modify it. This becomes cooler when you have like a nested case class. So let's imagine that this time instead of, our, our person has also an address. So and an address is also, is considered of a street number and a street name. So now, I have, an, I have a lens address between person and address, and a lens address, a street name between address and string. And I can compose these two things together in order to get uh, the street name out of a person, change it. And so when you see like the set method, recreate the whole object and it only changes the tiny part that it's focusing on. So you don't, I don't know if, you, if any of you had to use like nested copy, and it's pretty painful here. I will say it's much more convenient. Uh, more general lenses. So we can define lenses to top for tuples. So we can say if I have a tuple A and B, I can zoom to the first element of the tuple, or I can zoom to the second element of the tuple. And here are a few examples where I can just set anything or yeah, modify. And now we can compose this uh, the different optics we saw today is that before we said we are able to create an ISO between any case class and a tuple. So like we can say person to tuple is just, a person is just a tuple string and int. And now we have a lens, second, that permit to, to zoom into the second element of a tuple. So if we compose these two things together, it means that we can change the second element of a person just by uh, composing this ISO and this lens together. So it's kind of, it's a, in a sense like generic programming. So if you're able to generate this automatically, let's say for example using shapeless, this, this could be very convenient. Let's look at more fancy optics, or lenses in particular. So we can define uh, at, that is an optic that will focus into any element inside of a map. So we just give a key, and, and so we get a lens between any map KV into an option of V. And this option of V is very powerful because from the law, we know that we can set sum, because sum is, is an option, and by saying this, we, it means that we insert something. But if we set none, it means that we delete an element. So 
here it's the implementation. But I think more useful is to have like a diagram when we can see, imagine we have a, a map one that mapped to the digit one and two that map to two. Then we could say add three, set some three, and in that case it will insert both the key and the value, or we could delete it using none. No, one thousand dollar question. What, what's next? We have ISO, we have PRISM, and we have lenses. So we saw that PRISM are weaker ISO, lenses are weaker ISO, and here is a canonical definition. So do you have any idea what could we do next? Well, you're going to take the, uh, the um, F from the PRISM row and the G from the lens row. Make something out of that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you take both the, the weaker function from prism and the weaker function from lens, and you construct a new optic that I called optional. And, and by, by construction, we have this relationship. We know that all ISO are lenses, all ISO are prism, but also all lenses are optional and all prism are optional. So we kind of construct a diamond. And by transitivity, all, all ISO are also optional. So here is a definition. Uh, so, so now, what can, what can we do with this guy? Well, we know that we define these cons, prism, that just you know, split the list between a head and a tail, eventually. And we have this first, uh, this first lens that focuses into the first element of a tuple. Well, if we compose these two things together, we get the head of a list. So basically, here, head focuses from, from any list into its head, and it can fail. And why head is not a prism? Because you can think that if you focus into the head, then all you cannot go back. You, know, you lose some information, uh, as with a lens. And so here is how you could use it. Even funnier, oh no, another one. So here this one is like kind of the useless optional. This one just void, and it just always fail. So uh, it's uh, such a, an achievement. So basically, it's say like if get option always return none, set always return the input. That's nothing. So basically, we can create a, an optional between any types. We don't really care. So in that case, you know, if I get get option of hello, I will always fail. If I try to set, I will get exactly the same uh, value. So I can try to set an int inside of a string. Doesn't really matter. And if I use set option, I will know that this has failed. Well, how can, it, how can this be even useful? Well, if I try to implement index that will be an optional that zoom into some element inside of a list at, at a particular index. So we, we had head to focus into the first element, but let's try to generalize this. Here we could say if, uh, if the index is below zero, then we'll just return void, which just always fail. If uh, if i equals zero, then we take the head, and if not, well, we just deconstruct our list, zoom into the tail, and call it recursively. So this is not really efficient, but I find it beautiful that you can actually do it. And how could you use it? It's just like you can imagine that you try to change the element at index minus one, or just to get it, uh, and you see, like for example, if you try to set 10 at index 1, then you get like a new list where only the uh, element at index 1 has changed. And now, I mean, we implemented index for list, but what's beautiful is that we can get really easily index for vectors because we, imp we add this uh, ISO between vector and list. So we can just say, okay, so if I want index for vectors, I just transform my vector into a list and then compose it with my index that is between list and, uh, and an element. So we, we get all of them for free. Again, maybe not the most efficient, but, but we get them very easily. And why index is different than at? So at was for map, index is more for sequence, but I mean, you can use it for map as well, is because with index, we cannot, s we cannot insert an element anywhere or we cannot delete an element anywhere. And why we cannot do this is that you can imagine if you have a sequence that is like that has just uh, four elements, and I try to set something at index seven, then what do I put between 
4, 5, and 6. You know, for a map, you can insert something anywhere, so that's easy to delete and insert. But for a sequence, they have to be one after the other. So you can easily convert any, map, any at into an index, but you can't go in the other way around. So we saw four optics today. Let's try to see like, some concrete examples that run everything up. Let's take the case of an HTTP request. So what's an HTTP request? It has some HTTP verb or method. So let's say get and post. It has a URI, but a URI is a host name, a port, some path, and a query. And it has also headers. That I just simplify it as just a map string to string and a body. So in reality, it's much more complex than this, but this is just to see how, how could we use it. So let's take a simple request. That is just a get to localhost 8080 that goes to the pass ping and with a query parameter age equals 15. No headers, no body. Well, if I want to know what is a method, probably the simplest one, I can, I can define uh, a length between request and method because method is a field of request. I can define a prism between method and unit that will specifically focus into get. And I can use my lens to get it. Or I can compose this uh, lens and prism and call is matching just to know is my request as a get, uh, get verb. Probably more impressive. Uh, if you want to change the host name inside of an HTTP request, well, you can, again, define easily a, a lens between request and URI. Then you can define a lens between URI and the host name. And then you compose these two together, and you can change it. So basically, just nested case classes. And your original request is, recre is recreated. The only thing that has changed is this part. No. Let's try to say, I want to increment the uh, query parameter age. So how do I do that? Um, I zoom inside of my, uh, from my request, I zoom inside the URI, URI part. Then I zoom in the query element inside of the URI. Then I go at the index age, and I convert the key that is a string into an integer. So I do all these transformations, several of them can fail, but here I don't really care, I just want to say, I want to increment it by one. And here you go. And if you wanted to know if it was successful or not, you could use modify option. Now, if I want to insert an, a header inside of my HTTP request, well, I can use headers to zoom from request to headers, then headers is just a map, so I can use at, and then I can set it using a sum, so it will insert it inside of it. And basically, it will add this, this element inside of the map. And now, let's try to see. I'm cheating. I'm showing you something that I didn't present today, but something a bit more powerful. So let's have a look at this uh, HTTP request. It's again like for localhost. has some headers this time and some body. So let's think that I would like to modify every single headers that are, in that are in fact an integers and, that are, and their key start by x, um, what do you dash. call it, dash. Well, I could use traversal, and traversal, they are an optic that permit to focus into several elements at the same time. So just believe me that it's possible. And that you can actually zoom into headers, say, filter the index of your map to say, I want to focus into all index that start by x dash, then convert all string into integer, and then actually multiply them by two or, or do anything you want with them. And it will modify these two things together. So just to round up, today we saw these four optics, so ISO, lenses, prism, and optional. What I didn't show you is this traversal, fold, setter, and getter. But this is just what is, what's in monocle. If you go to Haskell lens, there is even more concept. So just to show you that there are, there are more, and, but, but I guess today you saw the most useful ones. And what's specific to Monocle, uh, so 
on top of this, we, we implement most of what I show you today. So like for all the standard library function or Scalazy, construct, Scalazy data structures, so we have like index, at, we have like different elements to zoom inside. Uh, we also, you know, one thing that lens optics are useful is to cut down the boilerplate, but actually you need some boilerplate to generate the, your, your optics. So the trade-off is that we created some, micro, some macro to, okay, sorry, I'm speaking, so to, to simplify the, the use of optics, and we have some syntax helpers. Here you are.